when a murder is discovered. What you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment covered over by twigs and other foliage. It doesn't just destroy one life. And then you find out what really happened. You read it in books, you see it in TV shows and everything else. It's really tough. Well, there isn't a day go by that you don't remember something. It tears communities apart. You can still speak to residents now, and they say they've never got over it. What happened to a young man in the midst of their little community here? It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. That was our hope, that where we were going was going to provide us with a treasure chest of information. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? In this episode, body parts are found on the streets of London. In that bag were two parts of a leg, upper and lower. So we now had at least three legs. I remember the police tape just being all across the estate and the police teams were going into the drains and all tents up and everywhere. Meet the murder detectives. They could see the bedroom door closed. The officers went in. When they entered the room, they found something wrapped in bin liners, a hacksaw and three knives. Had the appearance almost of an altar. Who revealed how they caught the killer. Two officers who turned up, gave chase, caught him, and he put up a tremendous fight. days after Christmas 2002, the streets of London were quiet as the capital city prepared for one of the biggest nights of the year, New Year's Eve. But in a North London HQ of the Metropolitan Police, a very disturbing call came in. The homicide assessment team phone rang at about four o'clock in the morning. Myself and a colleague fast-tracked down to outside a public house in Camden where it had been reported that some human body parts had been found. Brian Hook was the homicide assessment or HAT team leader that night. My initial thoughts whilst we were en route to there were a, a myriad of things going through my head. I didn't know what the body parts were, I didn't know where they'd been found, so it really was a question of getting there as soon as we possibly could. As the team raced to the scene, Commander Andy Baker, who was in charge of all homicide investigations in London, was brought up to speed. I got a call from one of my detective chief superintendents. He told me that a tramp-like individual was looking for food, rummaging in some community bins, and he found a bag. He opened the bag up. At first, he thought they were like fillets of something, I think fish, I'm not sure. But then when he pulled them out, he could clearly see that they were the calf muscles of the lower part of the legs. I then said, OK, what's the immediate kind of actions you're undertaking? He told me that Kenny Bell was a senior investigating officer, who I knew, I've known for years, very able, professional, brilliant SIO, and his team very good. Brian was a key part of that team at the crime scene. This is the general area that I arrived to on that morning. Where this wall is now, there used to be a back entrance way to the pub, and it was in there that the dustbin was, that the body parts were found. When I arrived, cordons had been set up by the first responders from uniform. I spoke to the officers that had been there, and in actual fact, I could actually see the body parts in the bin liner that had been torn open. One of the other factors when I arrived there was the smell of human decomposition. To have dismembered body parts on the streets of the capital was a very unusual event, but this part of northwest London had its fair share of crime. In 2002, Camden, very similar in many ways as it is today, vibrant, transient people coming, going through, lots of visitors, good pubs, but also had the I wouldn't say underworld side, but a, a, a seedier side to it as well. Drugs, down and out, sleeping on the street, rubbish strewn around. 
And I came here on the 30th of December and I came over the days as well as the case continued. There's a good sense of community. You are in central London and literally 500 yards up the road you've got three million pound houses. Here you've got council apartments. Being so close to Christmas, the streets were quiet, so a sudden police presence in the area attracted attention very quickly. Richard Osley is the deputy editor of the Camden New Journal newspaper. People were shocked that this was happening on their doorstep, and they were nervous about the fact that the perpetrator behind this was apparently on the run, nowhere to be seen. I remember the, the police tape just being all across the estate and the police teams were kind of going into the drains and all tents up and everywhere. The police team began their investigation with the man who had found the body parts in the bin. In all homicides, you work backwards. And we had a conversation about who the individual was that discovered the body parts, because obviously he would be a person of interest. So he was in a police station assisting us, but came to the conclusion, hold on, he's called police, he could have just left them there and walked away. He didn't, he did the right thing. With no other witnesses, the team had to begin considering where the rest of the body may be. Forensic psychologist Julian Boone was brought in to consult on the case. Usually, with dismembered body parts, there are one of two explanations. One is where the person who is the perpetrator has had to dispose of a body, possibly because there's been one almighty row and anger killing of the individual, say in a domestic violence dispute where someone has died. The second is because they get some form of kick out of it. Um, and that is rooted in something known as necrophilia. We talked about possibility of body snatchers, mortuary thieves, that kind of thing, but come to the conclusion that these were freshly cut legs and it was a deposit site. At the crime scene, officers on the ground were carrying out house-to-house -house inquiries, searching for anything that could help identify where the body parts may have come from. Every single door will be knocked on, the occupants will be identified, what they were doing at relevant times, and also what they know before the relevant times, because that is also what we need to know. What are the movements? What are the general movements around here? The first 24 hours, 48 hours of any murder investigation are key. They call them the golden hours. So you have to act quickly to seal that scene and you literally seal the scene, so you stop people going in and out. Anyone that does go in, their names are recorded. The team called in more officers to cover as much of this part of Camden as they could. We decided to put up a mobile police station so that people will see us there. Our focus was around Royal College Street. We needed to show a big presence there. We were in control. We were here. We are knocking on doors. We are searching. The local people were already speculating that this was more than just another murder. The impact on the community would quite clearly be very shocking and quite in the line with what I believe was the intention of the perpetrator was to cause as much shock and anxiety as possible amid the local community and to do what he could to emulate the London Ripper of over a century before. On data of the investigation, New Year's Eve, 31st December, quiet around this area, but we had extended our search of bins and house to house. And I was then told that we had found another bag, in fact, the bins further up, but this is Plender Street, found another bag with a small torso that could have been taken for a young girl. It wasn't, it was actually a woman in her 30s. Also in that bag were two parts of a leg, upper and lower. So we now had at least three legs and some long, dark, almost black hair. And in this bin were body parts from two bodies, clearly indicating this wasn't some sort of domestic murder. This was somebody who was getting a kick out of doing that as the ultimate finale of their crime. The discovery of a second 
load of body parts. We found out about, we were actually on the scene, so we were kind of interviewing people in this day, and all of a sudden, later in that evening, the police start searching another bin. It was obvious this was disposal. So that's why we extended the search of all bins, drains, areas, Regent's Canal, until we were satisfied that we couldn't find any more. in this case that he dismembered the bodies this can serve a few functions to the offender one it could be trying to get rid of evidence so they're actually trying to destroy the body literally to get away with murder the police were now happy the streets were secure but what they had found meant they had some very serious crimes on their hands there's concerns we still had to satisfy ourselves that this was a murder. These could have been body parts taken from a graveyard, from a mortuary, recently buried, etc. So we soon realised that it wasn't that because of how the bodies were dismembered and the more work we do on that. But the team becomes electric. We knew because we had two bodies that we had a serial killer. With two definite victims, but not one complete body, Camden was facing heading into the new year with a killer at large. At the end of December 2002 in Camden, London, there were now multiple teams of police on the street searching for a serial killer. There was no mention of any potential suspect at all. The hypotheses that were being formulated by individual officers and the senior investigating officer is really, really very, very loose at this point because there is no direction. We're looking for that direction, somewhere to go. The most important thing of that is the identification of the victims. If you can't identify your victim, then it's going to be doubly, doubly hard to find where the homicide actually took place. The reaction inside Camden around the college was this is an absolute tragedy and these are human beings. This is just terrible, it's happened on the doorstep. Don't care who they are, this is awful. On the streets, inquiries were continuing as police teams combed through the contents of every bin in the area. It was decided that the specialist search officers should go to the landfill site where Camden Borough sent all of their commercial, public and domestic waste. It's a massive, massive undertaking. 80 officers, three weeks sifting through tons and tons and tons of rubbish. As the search for physical evidence began, other officers were looking for witnesses. House to house is something that is seen as a bugbear by many officers, knocking on doors. You've always got to do that initial introduction. People want to know more than you can really tell them. And it would start with, there's been an incident, do you know who uses those bins, have you used those bins, who lives next door? While emptying all the bins in the local area, the police made another disturbing discovery. A search also turned up a bloodstained bra. That bloodstained bra was found in the bins that belonged to a particular flat. The occupier of that flat was one Anthony Hardy. Anthony, or Tony Hardy, was already well known to the police. He had been arrested at the start of the year. He had been arrested earlier in 2002 for criminal damage to a neighbour's front door where they had had a dispute over a leak. The dispute continued. He was assertive, aggressive, and then he had scrawled something on the neighbour's front door. This was in the same block of flats where they had just found the body parts. Following the dispute, the neighbours had called the police. The police went to that flat, they got the account of what had happened, including the history, that he was a big, burly guy and really in, in your face when you argued. They went to Hardy's flat, he was in. They went inside and they noticed that one of the doors was locked. When they said to him, have you got a key for that door that's locked, he said, no, I can't find it. As Hardy was acting suspiciously, they searched him and discovered the key. So the officers get in through that door and there's sadly the body of Sally Rose White on the bed. 
but they then immediately seal the scene. They arrest Hardy for suspicion of murder as well as criminal damage, and then the post-mortem is carried out. Sally Rose White had shared the flat with Hardy. Now, she was dead. Nightmare neighbour Anthony Hardy had suddenly become a potential killer, and the news soon caught the attention of locals. They had found the body in his flat of Sally Rose White. It hadn't been extensively reported in the paper, but the people knew about it. Although Sally White's body had been found in suspicious circumstances, police needed to identify a cause of death before bringing charges against Hardy. Hardy, when interviewed, said, I was drunk, he had an alcohol problem. Um, I woke up and she was dead. That post-mortem did identify the injuries to Sally and it also stated that Sally Rose White had died from natural causes from a heart attack. She had some congenital problem that was identified and she had died from that. As Sally was deemed to have died naturally, no charges relating to her death could be brought against Hardy. I covered the inquest at the time. That was a few months after she had been found in Hardy's flat. I went to the Crown Prosecution Service, where it was decided there was no case to answer for murder or any injuries to Sally Rose White. However, there was always that nagging doubt. Police officer came to court, read out some details. The pathologist report, which said she had died from natural causes, was deemed to be the most important thing here. And, and the, the coroner closed up and said, right, there's nothing suspicious here, there's no foul play. And, uh, and that was it. And the police afterwards said, well, if the coroner and the pathologist say it's natural causes, then we're not here to investigate natural causes, we're here to investigate murders. He was charged with criminal damage for the schooling on his neighbour's door. He went to court and he was remitted to a mental hospital for treatment. He wasn't in for long, though. He'd been sectioned afterwards, and then he had returned to the estate. So he'd gone straight back to the same flat and carried on as if nothing had, uh, had happened. And you know, he's still, the, the same neighbours that he'd had been in dispute with were still living there. So they were naturally, I think, uh, uneasy about what might have gone on when the police turned up soon after Christmas. Anthony Hardy had been released in November, seven weeks before the dismembered bodies were found near his flat. Anthony Hardy became a significant person of interest. We soon found out that Tony Hardy lived alone, that he was not seen in the area at the immediate time. That picture is becoming clearer and clearer. All the fingers are pointing at Tony Hardy. And it was decided that they would knock on his door, armed with a warrant to search it in any case, but to see what happened and also to see if he was there because he was a fairly obvious suspect at that point. The evidence was mounting. The team decided to search Anthony Hardy's flat. The officers engaged in house to house, knocked on the door of flat four and actually the door was open. We effected entry into that flat and I think the first thing that confronted the officers was the darkness. And that was darkness in colour as well as feeling. He had icons, satanic icons in the flat. He had lots of pornography. It was dark walls, a grubby bathroom, and this closed bedroom door. The officers went in. When they entered the room, they found something wrapped in bin liners on top of those bin liners on the floor, next to the bed, a hacksaw and three knives. Had the appearance almost of an altar. When they carefully opened the bin bag, they could see it was another torso of a woman. They then secured the scene. The flat was now a scene. We already thought it was a scene, but they secured it properly. And they went through the forensic process there are no carpets on the floor, there are paintings on the floor, there are paintings on the wall, some of which make sense, some of which don't. There's graffiti on the walls, graffiti on the doors. It's not a pleasant place to go into. We hadn't identified the person that was in the bedroom and it was transported to the mortuary for a post-mortem. We had the items used for dismemberment. 
I can recall one of the officers telling me that they could see on that hacksaw that, that it looked like little bits of skin. And then as we worked from the bedroom outwards, we then were able to gather other evidence that proved important, a devil's mask. With photographic equipment and a satanic mask in the flat, it looked as though Hardy had been making some form of sadistic pornography with his victims. The living room has a sofa. It has actually three TVs in it, a coffee table. Again, there are paintings on the walls. There are graphics that will probably mean something. There is lots and lots of debris around. Uh, the three TVs are hooked up to video recorders and all the video cassettes basically are pornographic. And it's my understanding that Hardy would sit there with his friends and watch pornographic movies. From just simply looking at the crime scene itself, um, this was a bizarre place. This was not some comfortable residence for a normal person. This is not the indulgences of, of a normal person who perhaps has a few sexual problems. This is someone who engages in sadistic activity, someone possibly with a psychopathic propensity and indifference to the victim as an object, but someone who requires a lot more than simply sex, possibly frustrated. With a warrant to search the whole house, police used chemicals and UV lights to look for evidence. One of the forensic decisions that was made was that luminol should be used at the scene. Luminol is used to locate blood at a crime scene. How this works is that the iron in the haemoglobin in blood, even if it has superficially been cleared away, will react with the luminol to create something called a chemiluminescence or a glowing. And this can then be photographed to detect areas where blood may be present or may have been present in the past. The bathroom yielded presence of blood splatters and blood in the bath. So he definitely had dismembered one or both of those women in the bath area. The blood stains that were found as a result of the luminol were identified as our two victims and also an unidentified female. Anthony Hardy was prime suspect for these multiple murders that would soon be referred to as the work of the Camden Ripper. In Camden, North London, New Year's Day 2003 was day three of a multiple homicide investigation and police were searching the home of their only suspect, Anthony Hardy. We'd found more body parts. We found the flat. We identified what was going on or what went on in there. The focal point being identifying the victims, the post-mortem outcome from that, cause of death. And on day three, we identified one of the victims as Elizabeth Fallad. With only a torso and one leg, the pathologist had used some unusual techniques to identify the body. She had had implants, breast and buttocks, and she was actually identified by a serial number on one of her buttock implants, which was unique to where it came from, how it was processed, and how it was implanted to Elizabeth. And then, obviously, we followed up with other forms of identification as well, DNA, etc. Body parts were first found on a Monday, and on a Thursday of that week, um, Anthony's Hardy name was circulated because he had left his flat. More body parts had been found in there, Hacksaw had been found in there. He was obviously the main suspect, the person the police wanted to speak to. The flat had also contained evidence that Hardy had been taking sadistic pornographic images of his victims. The perpetrator here clearly has some form of sexual problem. Very driven to sex, but not very good at delivering it. This would be a recipe for someone who becomes obsessed with pornography, where the fantasy world can take over a great deal from the, the real world. This possibly would indicate that his actual killings 
were for the purpose of producing pornography by posing as victims in masks that make them anonymous, that make them so they could be anyone when he views them again and they can fit into his fantasies. This was a very dangerous man. The Met Police considered Hardy a danger to others and released his details to the press in an attempt to track him down. Here we are looking for a six foot plus, 20 plus stone man with a beard, grey hair. The police actually put out an appeal saying we really need to find this guy and that's when Hardy's face was every TV channel, every newspaper, there he was. Once we identified Hardy, we researched his background. We ascertained that he did live in Australia for a while. He's originally a Brit, highly educated, went to Imperial College London, degree in engineering, was a senior manager in an engineering company, married, had a number of children. He and his wife moved from Norfolk over to Australia, Tasmania in fact. He had been deported from Australia because he had been arrested for domestic abuse when he had hit his wife over her head while she was having a bath, I think with a solid lump of ice in a plastic bottle. The perpetrator is continuously, absolutely abusive to women throughout his life. And there will be interpersonal coherence. In other words, across his life, in his domestic life, you would see that same interaction, that same bullying, uh, violent treatment of females as you would in the killing scenarios. This is someone who gains satisfaction from dominating and harming females in a sadistic way. The team now believed that Hardy had been targeting sex workers. Camden, its position there was very close to King's Cross. And at that time, King's Cross was an epicenter for prostitution, for where you go for sex. It was also about the crime that was there, uh, the drugs, the robberies, the lack of safety that people felt when traveling through that area. You know, it's just not nice to be there, but it, it was readily accessible for anyone who wanted to buy sex. It was looking like Anthony Hardy regularly came to this area looking for women to satisfy his needs. Something that we know about serial murders, and particularly sexual serial murders, is that there is often a background of extreme pornography, uh, use of prostitutes, where it's likely that they were very rough with the prostitutes and almost acting out things that they would like to do, and also the use of very deviant fantasies. The worst cases of sadism will end in rape and the worst cases of those will end in um, killing. And the worst cases of those will end up in dismemberment as being the final, most destructive thing you could inflict on another human being. Knowing they had a killer on the run, the Met had begun searching CCTV to trace Hardy and his last movements. The estate is covered by CCTV and it was on one of those cameras, the local authority cameras, that he was actually pictured dumping body parts into the dustbin. Behind me, the lower windows there, are the flat that Hardy used to live in. Perhaps one of the things to realise is that only a short distance in that direction, not more than 100 yards away, is where the initial body parts were found in the dustbin. So Anthony Hardy had only gone a matter of less than 100 yards before he deposited those remains. Hardy put the body parts in the back bins and, and put them out. I think he probably thought that they were going to be taken away very, very quickly. But because it was Christmas, the bin rounds were delayed. So there was just that little window where the bins weren't taken away. With a good profile of Hardy and one local sighting on CCTV, the team began to widen their net. Because he was missing, we focused on Tony Hardy more and more. We got a description of him, we got pictures of him, we circulated to the police. We knew he needed insulin and other medicine, so we circulated to local hospitals. Police feared that if Hardy didn't have his medicine, and if he was drinking, he could be more dangerous than ever. 
We see these individuals who are suffering in some way with mental health issues, depression, anxiety, personality disorder, schizophrenia, they self-medicate, which actually, of course, particularly if they're taking other types of medication, can really cause some other associated problems for them and makes things a lot worse. They feel better in the short term, but it's actually making their problems much worse. With his medical problems, police felt Hardy wouldn't stray too far from home. The flat where Anthony Hardy lived was quickly kind of boarded up. It was, you know, impossible to get a glimpse of what was going on inside. There was a lot of police tape there, and they had a kind of tarpaulin over the front, but we were there. With Camden locked down, police had teams searching Hardy's other known stomping grounds. So we're in the King's Cross area now. We're just approaching the station, the Great Northern Hotel. Um, this is the area, back in 2002, where sex workers would ply their trade. Uh, they would be street walkers. This is where Hardy came and met his companions, the women that he wanted sex with, the women that he paid, and as we know, the women that he abused and murdered. When Hardy was on the run for about three days, I think, and there were people ringing the police, there were people ringing here saying, you know, I think we've seen him here, we think, I think he was seen. I think someone was actually arrested in, in South London because someone had cited him, it wasn't him, the, the guy was let go. Some day he'd actually gone back to the estate and seen the police tape and then gone away quickly. He popped up where we missed him at University College London. We got CCTV of him actually going in and out of the entrance. He'd shaved off his beard and we had a better description. Police were now involved in a cat and mouse chase with Hardy as they began watching hospitals and places where he could get his prescription drugs. We're now in Queen Square outside uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children and on the 1st of uh, January, New Year's Day 2003, Tony Hardy came here looking for his medicine. An off-duty police officer spotted him, recognised him, phoned 999 because he was off-duty. Uh, police arrived. Hardy realised uh, that he'd been spotted, ran into the garden area around the back and two officers who turned up gave chase, caught him and he put up a tremendous fight. He had a small knife that he stabbed one of the officers in the hands, damaged his eye socket and the other one he knocked out but the one that was more injured uh, rather than being knocked out for a few minutes uh, held on to him. Other police arrived because it had come up Hardy's at the hospital. Fortunately a lot of police officers in the area New Year's Day, quieter for the police, so they were able to respond and catch him. It was no great surprise that Hardy had stayed local and he was arrested nearby. You generally find, because it's his comfort zone and there are places he would know and be comfortable with, he would either stay or go somewhere where he wasn't comfortable that would be miles away. He was arrested on Thursday night, I think, and charged over the weekend. So during that time, everybody was trying to uh, find out who this guy was. The press were aware, so we agreed with some of them who we knew that we would give them a fuller story in a fullness of time. And as soon as he was found in a children's hospital, the news took another spin. The reaction when he was arrested and charged was, I guess, relief because this when are they going to find him question had finally been answered. But also about this time it was kind of being revealed about the first death in his flat and people were putting two and two together and saying that it all fits together now. New Year's Day 2003. Hardy had been arrested outside Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. I got the phone call at around 9pm. My job was to allay uh, other senior officers that we've got the person, publicity around we've caught the person, you know, people can relax, sex workers in King's Cross, you know, this person's not a large, and making sure that that's all in place. Anthony John Hardy, in the way that he committed these appalling crimes, has exhibited a, a degree of depravity that I personally have never ever come across before. And there's one other important thing as well, and that's making sure that our family lawyers and officers can let the families know that we've caught the person. So that had to be done. There's a great sense of relief, it's captured. Euphoric, maybe not. When Anthony Hardy was arrested, it was a huge relief to the investigation team, mainly because it meant that he could not commit further offences. That was always, always the danger, and it preyed heavily on the senior investigating officer's mind that there could be further victims. 
Hardy was taken to Collindale Police Station. Once he was in custody, SIO Kenny Bell realised their suspect wasn't in the best of health. He was seen by a doctor. He had to go to hospital because the doctor thought that he had gangrene on one of his legs. We took him to a local hospital in Edgware where the nurse washed his leg and said it was dirt. But that shows you the type of life that he lived and also I think shows the vulnerability and the desperation of his victims. He was a dirty individual, but he was paying. He then was interviewed over a number of hours into days. We called in a regular psychologist. That psychologist was Julian Boone. My involvement in the investigation, I think, was because of my background as a specialist in sadomasochism and in necrophilia and in cannibalism, anybody who's interviewing Hardy or his ilk should know or be warned about what they're getting out of it so that they can effectively not be hoodwinked. With psychologist Julian having briefed them, officers faced Hardy in the interview room. You are focusing on the interview, and it's very professionally done. Not only have you got the two officers conducting the interview, you've got others that are observing. It's the heavy lifting of any case. And also, you know, especially when you have the magnitude of evidence against someone like Tony Hardy, he decided to say no comment, which is his right. Do you know that bit at all? No comment. Have you ever used that bit, Tony? No comment. Have you ever gone to that bit at all? No comment. They ever put any rubbish in it? No comment. Will ever take any rubbish out of it? No comment. In my experience around interviews, you can't trick people, you can't threaten people, you can't duress people, but sometimes move away from that question. So start talking about their personal life, what they're interested in, just to see if they will talk to you. Hardy talked to the police outside the interview, so we even considered, should we use someone else to see if he would open up? Hardy decided no comment and he kept no comment and we were never going to budge him. With Hardy saying nothing, the investigation continued, beginning with trying to identify the second victim. In cases of dismemberment such as this, a skeletal inventory will first be put together to determine in fact how many individuals have been found, whether that be one or more. Once the remains have been identified as belonging to a single individual, which will usually be done using DNA profiling or perhaps blood group analysis, the remains will be assessed by a forensic pathologist to look for evidence of biological identification. It was on the fifth day, so by now we're, I think we're the third of January, we identified Bridget McLennan and her history came to the fore. Bridget McClelland was identified for a number of means. We had had a couple of calls about missing people, but we confirmed it completely through DNA. Both victims were identified as sex workers. Once they were named, more links to Hardy came to light. We were contacted on two fronts from someone that knew Hardy, he thought was a really good friend and by a member of the press, and they said that they were aware of photographs in circulation, which we recovered, which showed our two victims, Elizabeth and Bridget, dead, fully bodied, not dismembered, uh, but put into pose. They were posed with some artifacts, headwear, masks that he had in his flat, a New York baseball cap that he actually had with him at the time when arrested. This hat linked him with the victims, but also with the murder scene and evidence they had already gathered. One of the items that the CCTV shows is Hardy depositing body parts and he's wearing a New York Yankees baseball hat. He was also wearing that when he was arrested. That was examined and photographs of the victims in the bedroom and they're also wearing that hat and their DNA and Hardy's DNA was found in that hat as well. Other evidence found at Hardy's flat all helped to build a very strong case against him. Anthony Hardy's DNA was found on knives and the hacksaw that was found sitting on top of Elizabeth Vallad's torso in the bedroom. 
Police also reopened the case of Sally White, who had been found dead in Hardy's flat in January 2002, almost 12 months before. As a result of the investigative process, the unexplained death of Sally Rose White was revisited and reinvestigated. The opinion of the pathologist in revisiting the post-mortem was that it was more than likely that Anthony Hardy had also killed Sally Rose White. What staggers me about this case is how the perpetrator managed to evade justice by cunning, by luck, by a cloud of mental illness, and the fact that it happened partly within our own justice system, as I say, it staggers me. When we look at the, the murders and we look at the behaviours that were taking place, um, this individual will fall into the category of sadistic serial killer. So the necrophilia, the activities that were in taking place with the body, um, he would fall into that category. And what this tells us is that a sadistic serial killer, according to research, is more likely to repeat the offence. By the end of the year, Anthony Hardy had been christened the Camden Ripper by the press and faced trial for multiple homicides. Once interviews are complete, decisions made to charge, he's charged, his fingerprints, photographs are taken, a short statement is put to the media. Hardy was eventually charged with all three murders, Bridget McLennan, Liz Vallad and Sally Rose White. He was due to stand trial at the Central Criminal Court, the Old Bailey, in November 2003. The investigation was prepared for a not guilty plea. Witnesses were warned. The evidence was finely tuned and honed and ready to be submitted to the court. On the day of the start of the trial, Hardy changed his plea and pleaded guilty to all three murders. And he pleaded guilty with no intimation that he was going to do that beforehand. And surprise, maybe you always think that some might, but he pleaded guilty. The facts of the case were presented by counsel. These terrible details were read out to the court about how he had photographed the victims after they had died and dressed them in demonic masks. So he'd pleaded guilty. The prosecutor outlined what they thought had happened, what he had admitted to, and then there was a uh, brief mitigation and then that was it, he was convicted. But he looked around at all of us and kind of just walked out and that was it. The reaction amongst the team when he pleaded guilty and was sentenced is, we knew it anyway, we've done our job, and let's hope life means life. Anthony Hardy was given three life sentences and that life sentence is a life means life sentence. There's no prospect of release for Anthony Hardy. It wasn't obvious at the immediate time back in November 2003. It wasn't until 2010, until the rules changed, the judge reviewed it and said, no, in this case, life means life. A man who murdered three women and mutilated two of their bodies has been jailed for life. Anthony Hardy, who's 53, had been released from a psychiatric hospital because staff didn't consider him to be a danger. But he'd already committed one murder and a month after his release, committed two more. He didn't voice this, but we all know he was a serial killer. He was a vindictive, nasty individual that uh, went beyond just murder. All detectives involved in those investigations see and touch and smell and hear things that nobody should have to do. I think the biggest thing with Hardy, personally, was that I don't think it's the first time he's done it. In fact, in my heart of hearts, I know it's not the first time he's done it. I think for people who were around Camden at a time, the Camden Ripper killings will always be, they, they won't forget them. They won't forget what happened that Christmas. How I would describe Hardy, would I describe him as evil? Yes, that is one word I'd use for him. Intelligent, cunning, desperate, nasty, perverse, caught. Cool.